Hello, family and friends. Day 209 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. If you are new to this Bible study, welcome. Please let us know where you are in the world. This is a worldwide Bible study. We got people from all ends of the earth. And also everything that you need will be in the description box below. Also make sure you like this video if this helps you in any sort of way. Also please, if you can, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you know when every video comes out each day. So let's pray and prepare our hearts as we humble ourselves before the Lord to receive his word. So our Father who art in heaven, we just praise you. We begin this time with praise because you are worthy and deserving of it all. We thank you that you are our Father, our friend, our Redeemer, our Restorer, our Healer, and the list goes on and on because you are everything that we need. So whatever those needs are today, Lord, we lay it all out before you and we say thank you that you are fulfilling that because you are the I am. So we love you, Jesus, and we ask you that you please forgive us for our sins right now. Every sin that we have ever done, please reveal to us anything that we may need to repent of, that we may not even realize that we're doing wrong. I pray, Holy Spirit, and give you full permission to convict our hearts today, not in any sort of way that condemns us or makes us feel stuck in our past, but in a way that will move us forward and will give us the desire to please you and to honor you with holy living. Please also help us, Lord, to forgive others who might have come against us in any sort of way, who have hurt us, who have said something against us. I pray that you will give us the capacity to be able to have that strength to forgive them. Because Lord, when we are able to forgive, we know that it releases us from captivity of a sin. It releases us from their grasp, Lord. We don't want to be under the grasp of somebody else. We want to be under your control. And so we ask that you will help us to free them today, to cut those ties from those who might have come against us. And Lord, please don't lead us into temptation. Please deliver us from evil. Keep the enemy far away from us. But Lord, if it is your will to use the enemy to strengthen us, to purify us, then let it be done, Lord, because all we want is your will for our lives and nothing else. So we love you, Lord, and we honor you. We praise you again. We begin with praise. We end with praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So bringing you back to a story we have already read about. This was at the time when the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, came against Hezekiah and all of the people. Remember when he was making them question, like, is it really God who's going to deliver you? Do you really think anybody can help you? And now we're going to see Hezekiah's response. Now, again, we've already read about this. So if it sounds familiar to you, it's because we read about it in Isaiah 36 recently. So as soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes as a sign of grief and humility. He, so he humbles himself and covered himself with sackcloth and he went into the house of the Lord. Or in other words, he went into the courts of the Lord because of course he's not a priest, so he can't actually go into the inner parts of the temple, but he did go into the courts, which is where all of the people could go. And this is the best place for him to have gone. Sometimes it's the hardest place. You know when the enemy attacks you? Sometimes that will get you into a place where you actually don't want to go to church, which is the weirdest thing. You would think that it would turn us toward the Lord, but a lot of the time it actually pulls us away. And so when you start to feel that way, if you ever feel like you don't want to go to church or you don't want to show up to Bible study, that is probably the most important time to show up because the enemy knows what is at church, what is going to be spoken in Bible study that will convict your heart or that will sharpen your heart in such a way that will be a threat to him. So if you start to feel like you don't want to show up, show up because God's got something for you. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priest covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. They said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress. It's of rebuke and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God. So Rabshakeh was his general. And will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So remember, he humbled himself. 
The second good thing he did is he went into the house. And the third thing is that he is seeking the word of God. He goes to Isaiah the prophet. Now we have direct access to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all those things shall be added to you. So go to the Lord in prayer first, and then crack open the word. Because the word is what is going to help direct you along with the Holy Spirit's guidance. Therefore, lift up your prayer. So he's asking now for a prayer. So pray for us, please. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, say to your master. So he's like, here's my response. This is what the Lord is going to say. Thus says the Lord, don't be afraid because of the words that you have heard. They're mere words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. There's some truth to that being spoken. But if we're going to keep it real here, we know that words hurt. I say it all the time when people come at me with some unjust criticism or saying things that are negative, it hurts me. It stings a little bit. It's still an arrow from the devil. But the thing is, is that it cannot destroy you. You are going to determine, your faith is going to determine what those words do to you. Are you going to allow them to destroy you? Or are you going to allow them to now strengthen you and light a fire under your butt where you're like, "Uh uh-uh, devil, you are not going to have that hold over me. So let's do a heart check. Whose words do you put more faith in? And when I say more faith, I mean, do you fear the words of man more than you fear the words of God? Do you put more faith in the words of man than you do in the word of God? And a good indicator of that is how you allow the words of man to affect your heart. So again, he says, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servant of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Now the servants, this is an insult by calling them servants. It's basically calling them little errand boys, like these little worthless twerps that have come from the king of Assyria. Don't worry about what they're saying. They're worthless. It means nothing. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. So God knows exactly how it's all going to play out. Some translations say he puts a lying spirit in them. And so some would question, wait, what? God is not supposed to be a liar. The word always declares that he is truth. He's not a liar. He's not. He's not actually putting the lying spirit in them. He's simply allowing the events to play out and he is going to use that evil for his purpose. And notice where this judgment is being pointed. It is being pointed straight at the king and not necessarily for the people of Assyria. I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Now the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning Terheka, king of Cush, behold, he has set out to fight against you. So he sent messengers again to Hezekiah saying, thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden, by the way, that's not Genesis Eden, who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath? the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hina, or the king of Iva. So the enemy is still, even though he's far away now, still trying to throw out his arrows and throw out his threats from afar. But the thing is, is that the enemy's words and the enemy's arrows are always limited. His power is limited. He is on a leash. He's got to know that, and you've got to know that too. So that when you feel like he's coming at you, You can picture him on a leash in the hand of God because God is sovereign over good and evil. So Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord. So he did the same thing, very good, (laughs) to the house, spread it before the Lord. So essentially he is, he already knows that God is aware of what is going on, but he still decides to put it out before God because this is his 
way of showing that he has complete dependence on God's deliverance. This is the same as if we were to go before the Lord and cast all our cares upon him. He already knows what's in our heart, but it is still important that we lay it all out before him and say, Lord, I need your help with this, 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 and this. We need to be specific and speak to him because when we start to cast our cares upon him and have a conversation with him, Little do we know it's actually opening our heart up so that he can then respond to us and we will be able to hear it. It opens our ears. It clears out all of the earwax when you talk to the Lord. All right. So Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. So he starts off his prayer by declaring who God is. He lifts him up. He sees his majesty. He is sitting here saying, you are God and we are not. Nothing is beyond your control. And the thing is, is that when we lift up God, when we exalt him, our own faith arises. So when we lift him up, when we make him big, then our problems actually start to shrink and they pale in comparison to who he is and what he can do for us. And in that time, especially. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib which he has sent to mock the living God. So he is showing him, Lord, he's not only coming against us, he's coming directly against you, the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So they were just worthless idols. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So his whole purpose of his prayer and asking for the deliverance of God was not necessarily just for their own deliverance, but it was more so for the glory of God. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. So he is saying, I have seen your faith today. And this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. So this is super important, once again, that he came and spoke to the Lord. He prayed to him. Because what if he hadn't? That God is actually saying, because you prayed, I am now going to answer you. And we just ask the question, like how many prayers go unanswered or are left unclaimed because we don't ask? Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened. If we don't, the door won't open. If we don't ask, we won't receive. So this again, another good reason why we've got to be people of prayer and specific in the words and pray out loud. Use that time in your car. You know, nowadays people have Bluetooth, so you don't look weird anymore. <laughs> you know, when you're sitting there yelling, you could be yelling at your husband for all anybody else next to you knows. I do it all the time. This is my time of prayer and yelling and spiritual warfare is in my car. Now don't do it recklessly. Like if you can't yell without, you know, being able to pay attention to the road, then don't do it. <laughs> and definitely don't close your eyes when you're praying. You can pray with your eyes open, by the way. She despises you. So this is what the Lord is saying. This is his response. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. So he calls her the virgin daughter because one, they have not yet been overtaken by idolatry and they have also not been invaded. Israel's been invaded. The North's been invaded. Judah's been invaded, but Jerusalem hasn't. So, or since David. So that's why he calls her the virgin daughter. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights against the Holy One of Israel? So he's like, do you know who you're dealing with? Now God will deal with people. You know, he is doing this. He's dealing with them himself. And so that is why we can be, we can rest assured that we don't have to be the ones to go battling against our brothers and our sisters. Let God deal with them. Let Holy Spirit convict their hearts. We can plant a seed, but don't waste your energy fighting about things. Let the Lord do it. Instead, pray for them. Pray for their peace. Pray for wisdom. Pray for your own peace and wisdom because maybe you're mistaken. You know, anytime we attack believers, we are essentially attacking God himself. That is what is being said here. Like you aren't just coming against 
my people. You're coming against me when you come against my people. So let that sink in. When you fire at your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are firing at God. Now, there's a difference between firing at and lovingly speaking truth. There's a difference. So I hope you know the difference there. All right. By your messengers, you have mocked the Lord and have said, with my many chariots, I've gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest, and I dug wells there. I drank foreign waters and I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. So he's now saying, you know how you had all of that pride and everything that you've done? You thought that you were self-assured? Well, listen up. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? So God's like, I'm in charge here. I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins. While their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded, and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it's even grown. But I know you're sitting down and you're going out and coming in and you're raging against me. Now, this should be seen as a good thing in the eyes of a believer. I thank God that he knows my sitting down, my getting up, my going out, my coming in. I want him to know everything about me so that he can keep me from doing stupid things, so that he can keep me from walking the wrong way. That is why I always say, God, get, I give you permission to do what you need to do, to poke a thorn at me if you have to. If it's going to hurt a little bit, fine. I don't want to walk down the wrong road anymore. So that should be a good thing. But for those who are against God, this is not a good thing. Because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put a hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. So he is saying, I'm going to treat you exactly the way that you have treated others, because this was the way Assyria led people away, was by putting a hook in their nose and a bit in their mouth and treating them like animals. And this shall be the sign for you this year. Eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs of the same. Then in the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now we talk a lot in this Bible study about bearing fruit, about sharing the goodness of God, about being able to share the fruit of the Holy Spirit goodness, kindness, patience, faith, gentleness, all of those things that we read about in the New Testament. But how can we bear fruit if we don't have roots going down? There can never be fruit without the invisible roots underground. Those roots for us is the word of God that sinks down deep into our hearts. And those roots don't develop out in the open. They're developed in the unseen times. They are developed in those times when you are waking up and you are in your word and you are on your knees behind closed doors and you are praying fervently and you are in your car yelling at God. That is the time when the root system is really starting to grow and fan out and build that strength so that that fruit can now come forth and that it will be strong and be able to weather any storm. So if you want to bear fruit in your family, in your business, in your workplace, in your relationships with your friends, with your own relationship with God, if you want to bear fruit, your root system has to be healthy. So let's do a heart check. What does your root system look like? Is it rotting underground or is it healthy? Is your soil and your heart healthy in such a way that when the word comes upon it, it is already sinking down, it is being nourished, and it is about ready to break forth that fruit and that harvest. And you ask, well, how do I know? Well, let's just keep it simple here. When somebody attacks you, how do you respond? What fruit wells out out of your heart? Does patience well up? Does quietness well up? Does goodness well up out of your heart? Or do you immediately get angry? Do you lash back out at them? Do you start yelling? That's one easy way to determine what the condition of your root system is. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. 
Now this will be a remnant of both his people and the land itself and the crops. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So he is going to defend his glory and defend his covenant that he made with David. So he, in the same way, still does that, still defends his glory and defends his covenant that he has made with us and therefore he will fight for us because of that not because we are righteous not because we deserve it we might we might be righteous and we might deserve it but that's not why he does it he does it to defend his glory and because of the covenant that he has made but those things are done out of love always out of love and that night the angel of the lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And remember, if you remember this from last time, 20 years passed by before this next verse. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, which is the same thing, I believe, as the Nusku god, which is a corrupt form of Marduk, the chief god. Okay, so this is some sort of big god in their eyes. Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So we don't know why the two sons decided to kill him, but they did. And the assumption is that, one, either they thought they might have been sacrificed because they did human sacrifice back then, or two, the fact that Esar Haddon was going to become king in his place. They might have done this out of jealousy, but nevertheless, they did it. That is that, that is the fact. And this just goes to show that his evil was passed down. And we started off this Bible study with praise as we spoke out our praise to our Father. And now we get to read about praise again songs of celebration chapter 46 in psalm this is one of three psalms that were songs of celebration it's a psalm of trust and this is related around second kings 18 and 19 the story that we just read now i like to write these notes when these things uh, line up with other chapters because it's not like you know one day i'm going to open up my bible and remember that i had just read second kings chapter 19 so i always like to write it down so that when i read it in the future i'm like oh it was that story okay and then i can go back and i can read it and just have a good perspective so we start off here uh it begins with god's provision god is our refuge and he is our strength a very present help in trouble. Now this word trouble here literally means tight spot. When we're in a tight spot, God is the one who is going to be our help in that. So he is our defender against all things. He's our protector. He is our strength when we're weak and he's going to help us get out of the trouble we're in. Therefore, we will not fear because he is all of that to us. We shouldn't fear when we know that God's protecting us and defending us. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. That sounds scary. Can you imagine if that was really happening, how fearful you would be? Though its waters roar and foam. So this is depicting kind of this out of control chaos, this helplessness. Though the mountains tremble at its swelling. And we too, like in this chaotic world that we live in, we don't have to fear because God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. That is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. So how do you respond when you are in times of trouble or in those tight spots? Do you respond with faith or with fear? Verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now the thing is, is Jerusalem had no water. Most cities back in this day were built around waterways. Actually, a lot of the biggest cities in the world are built around water. There's a reason for that. It was because there was transport. There was the ability for trade. And Jerusalem did not have that. However, Hezekiah was smart enough to go to Siloam and dig a tunnel 
um, from, or he went from Gihon to Siloam, and they dug it right into Jerusalem. So from one end to the other, they dug a tunnel that was 720 feet long that met right into Jerusalem, bringing them water so that if they were attacked, they would still have a water source, which was a life source, right? And thankfully, we've got that life source. We literally have living water within us. With the Holy Spirit in us, that is the living water that lives in us, so we'll never thirst. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. But the Lord of hosts is with us. Like the God of the armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So he is God of the heavens, God of the earth. And when he says God of Jacob, he is declaring this covenant. He is the God of a covenant. And he is a God who emphasizes his grace on Israel here by saying, I am the God of Jacob, the God of the deceiver. And yet I still call you Israel. I still call you this upright nation. I still call you righteous. And that's what he does with us. He calls us by the best names, whereas the enemy does the opposite. He calls us by the worst names. He accuses us. So come, behold the works of the Lord, the works meaning his glory. Behold his glory. How he has brought desolations on earth through his final judgment. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and sh- or the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. So be still and know that I am God. Raise your hand, put a hand emoji or say me in the comments if this is one of your favorite verses in the Bible. Be still and know that I am God. Is this something that gives you hope? Like when you are in the midst of chaos, like, Lord, I'm just going to be still right here in this moment and know and trust that you are everything that I need. You are God. You are sovereign over everything that is going on around me. I acknowledge that. I surrender to it. I submit to it. Now, being still is not physically stopping in your tracks and not doing anything. Being still is stilling your fearful spirit, getting it under control, putting it under uh, in, in submission to God. I will be exalted among the nations, he says. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Woo, can we all shout a big old hallelujah? Write that in the comments. Hallelujah, if you agree with that. Amen. So now we head over to Psalm 80. This is a community lament where they are crying out to God to restore them. So we start off here. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. So shepherd of Israel, who is that? Jesus, of course. Joseph oftentimes was re- being referred to as all of Israel because of the size of Joseph's tribes and his sons being those two tribes within one. So when he says, you who lead Joseph, he's like, you who lead Israel like a flock. So he is the shepherd. He cares for them. He loves them. He heals them. He leads them, guides them, all of the things. And also Joseph is likened to a fruitful bough in Genesis 49, meaning you all are overflowing with fruitfulness. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim. So this is a picture of him being on high between the cherubim, a picture of the mercy seat where his glory dwells. Shine forth. So basically when God shines forth his light, All darkness has got to flee. He gets magnified when his light shines forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. So again, this is another way to say all of Israel or the whole nation. Stir up your might and come to save us. So here we are calling out for this saving and this restoration. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And I don't know about you, but this is a really good prayer. God, let your face shine upon us. And remember, that came from the priestly blessing. And it represented God's presence, his pleasure, his favor shining upon you, being upon you. O Lord of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? So because they were not getting this deliverance that they were requesting for, they thought that their prayers were going unanswered. But remember that God answers prayers in three different ways. He's either going to show up and say, yes, here I am, let's go. He's going to say, nope, I'm not doing that. Or he's going to say, not yet. 
I need you to be patient. And more times than not, it's usually that because that then turns into patience, endurance, it strengthens us. You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. So he's saying, you haven't given us the manna or the water to drink. They're now having to eat from their own tears that they're crying. That's all they have left. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Specifically speaking about Moab and Edom who were constantly at war with them and mocking them and trying to be a rival against them. So this is a complaint about the Lord's anger. But they say once again, so he said it up here, he's going to say it again, restore us, O God of hosts. So when he says restore us, this is expressing trust and dependence on God. And he's reiterating it here. Anytime repetition happens in the Bible, it emphasizes something. Well, this is emphasizing God's power and authority to be able to do this restoration. Let your face shine that we may be saved. In other words, that we may be rescued from the assaults of those who surround us. You brought a vine out of Egypt. So this is declaring that they were a royal vine. They are royalty in the hands of God. And you drove out the nations and you planted it right into Canaan. So this is a metaphor of a vine. Now, Israel is referred to in three different ways with three different types of plants. One referred to as the vine from the time that Israel is planted in the promised land to when the Messiah comes. And this shows that they're in need of the support of God. They are in need of this saving grace. And they are only valuable whenever they're fruitful. Because remember, anytime Jesus would find a vine that was unfruitful, then it had no value at that point. Then they're referred to as the fig. This is during the time uh, between when they reject the Messiah to the second coming. So that's kind of right now. Israel is essentially a fig right now. We're waiting on the second coming of Jesus. And then they'll be referred to as the olive or the olive tree. And that is from the time of the second coming to the millennium kingdom, the millennial kingdom. So right now in this prophecy or in this uh, psalm, we are referring to Israel as a vine in need of a savior. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and it filled up the land. And they did. They increased in population, so they did fill the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea, to the Mediterranean Sea, and its shoots to the river, to the Euphrates. So they populated all the way from the Med Sea to the Euphrates River. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck up its fruit? So now we're referring to the ruined vine. First it was the royal vine, now it's ruined because God has removed his protection from them because of their own sin. And so now people are devouring them. They're devouring their fruit. They're plundering them and they're being uprooted like the way that the boar does in people's yards. If you've ever had a pig in your yard, we had lots of pigs in Hawaii, they ruin your yard. And that's why a lot of people actually hunt pigs, not so much because they want to eat bacon, but more so because of the way that they're almost like a nuisance and they ruin the yards and then they become feral and there's all kinds of them everywhere. But the boar from the forest ravages it. And I apologize for any vegetarians or vegans out there who are freaking out right now. And all that move in the field feed on it. And now we're going to refer to this vine as the restored vine. So turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see us in our pitiful state. Have regard for this vine, restore it, God, the stock that your right hand planted and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They've cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand. So let your hand be on Jesus. Because who sits at the right hand of God? Jesus. The son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Now they were desperately in need of leadership here. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, God. Revive us and we will call upon your name. So they're basically saying, Lord, we cannot call upon you. We cannot glorify you or praise you or worship you if we're dead. So please give us life. And of course, Jesus. Jesus gives us life. He revives us. He restores us. He saves us. He lets his face shine upon us. So throughout this psalm, all of the things that they are asking for, we 
get to have the benefits of through Jesus in this time. What a glorious time for us to be living in this time of having Jesus as our Savior. They didn't have that. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And again, ending our reading today with praise. This psalm physically starting off with praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord who stand in the house of the Lord. So this is a call for the priests to praise the Lord. Those were the servants in the house, in the courts of the house of our God. Now this is a call for all people who are able to stand in the courts to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the Lord is good. So now we're being given reasons to praise him. We don't praise him out of a feeling. We praise him for reasons. Praise is something that we do because of the fact that he is good. Sing to his name for it is pleasant. It is a pleasant thing. It does start to bring forth joy when you open yourself to praise the Lord for who he is, not because of what you want from him and not because you're seeking some sort of feeling of goosebumps and chills and, you know, that momentary encounter with the Holy Spirit. No, this is a continual thing that we are able to have this heart of praise to honor his character and nature and all of him. It brings about joy for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. This is another reason why we praise him because he has chosen us. So this is a psalm again of descriptive praise. And this is specifically after the Babylonian exile. I forgot to mention that. Those were the notes that I like to put in there so that I remember, oh, okay, this is the time period of which this was written. For I know that the Lord is great. So he's coming from a place of assurance here. And that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does because he simply can. He's got all authority. He's got all power to do whatever he wants. And we can't really say anything about it. If we do, that's coming against what he's doing. Um, whatever he does, pleases, he does in heaven and on earth. And this is a word that comes from Psalm 115 verse three, in the seas and all the deeps. So this is a praise to a great and very active God. He is not a dormant God. He's not just sitting up there looking at us like a bunch of fools. He's actually active in our lives. Now the psalmist uses two forms of the word Lord. One in Hebrew, the word Adonai, which means master. And again, Lord in all caps, but little caps, Yahweh which is the covenant God, the covenant name of God. He, it was, and as I was reading this, I kind of got confused in the wording of this. He, it was, I'd rather say it was he. <laughs> so I'm going to say it. it was he who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast. So now we're rehearsing sort of this night of the Passover during the Exodus out of Egypt. Who is in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants. So now we're seeing his might over all of the nations over Egypt, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings. So other nations as well. Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan. And if you don't remember these stories, we see that in Numbers 21 and Deuteronomy 3. And all the kingdoms of Canaan and gave their land as a heritage and a heritage to his people Israel. So we are praising him now for his saving works. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown or your fame, O Lord, throughout all of the ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. So we're praising him now for his saving name, not just for his saving works, but also for his saving name. So we are looking at God here in his incomparable greatness, his never ending fame, his immutable or unchanging ways. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. And again, this comes from Psalm 115 also, but verses four through eight. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears and don't hear. So basically they're like, you know what? We are over it. We are over these idols because they're worthless. They're not doing anything for us. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. So remember, we become like that which we worship. So if you want to become empty, foolish, then worship an idol, especially when you compare to God, which they're doing here. They're like, okay, we see now. And it's funny that, you know, man makes idols, yet they subject themselves to these idols in submission to them. 
and essentially becomes smaller against these little wooden images. It's just weird to think about. But when we humble ourselves before God, he actually makes us bigger. When you humble yourself, he exalts you, he honors you. And it's quite the opposite with idols because typically when you worship idols, you will become more prideful and lift yourself up. But what does God do to those who are prideful? He humbles them. So what side of the fence are you gonna be on? Are you gonna be on the lowly, humble side and allow God to then exalt you? by honoring him and worshiping him or the other side of the idols. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. So this is declaring that he is the source of all blessing. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. So that's a call to all of us. If we fear the God, bless him. We bless your holy name, Lord. And we do this by saying, blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And the fact that it says that you want to bless the Lord from Zion, this is declaring that he is not like the local deities who were confined to a certain space, a certain nation, city, whatever it was. He goes be beyond Zion. He comes out from Zion and extends outward beyond the borders. And again, praise the Lord. We end this day. We end this psalm with praise. And again, can everybody just shout a big hallelujah? My kids know me and they think I'm wild, but I walk through my house shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. But you know what's really cute? Is that my kids do it now. When something awesome happens for them or when they feel like they've been saved from something, which you know is really small compared to the things that we deal with, but in their eyes, it's a huge thing. And they're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. And you will never know what kind of effect you have when you start to praise the Lord, when you start to bless his name, when you start to lift him up, you don't realize the impact that you have on other people. Feel crazy for a moment. Let let it happen. Be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Let them think what they want to think, but you will be blessing the heart of God and it is awesome. You will start to see something different in them as they see something different in you. So do it. Do it right now when you're in your own room. Get practicing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love it. Do I look weird? I don't care. Okay, so let's close this out with prayer. This was a wonderful reading today. I don't know if you can tell, I'm a little bit excited about it. Because again, that's what praise does. It brings forth joy. So thank you, Lord. We praise you for who you are. We begin our day and we end our day with praise. Help us to get into that habit, Lord, where we start to praise you on a daily basis, consistently bless your holy name because you are God and we are not. We have no control over our lives or over our circumstances, so why are we even gonna try? So we lay it all out before you, Lord. We're gonna take this moment right now. If some of us have gotta pause the video and we are going to have a conversation with you and say, Lord, this is what I'm dealing with today. This is what's taking over me. This is what is giving me anxiety. Lord, I wanna just spread it all out before you the way that Hezekiah did so that you can then open up my ears, clear out the earwax to give me an answer, Lord. So that when the enemy tries to shoot his arrows, they will not be able to get over that wall and we will be able to hold our peace. Lord, may we always be people who have more faith in your words than the words of what people are speaking to us or against us. Even words of encouragement and flattery, God, may we put more faith into your word and less into the words of people. And as we glorify you and bless you and lift you up and exalt you, God, may our faith arise and start to strengthen and get bigger, Lord, so that our problems will shrink in comparison to your holiness and your goodness. And the fact that you will come, you will rescue, you will restore, you will fight for us so that we don't have to worry, Lord. God, teach us to be people of prayer. Teach us how to pray. Help us to speak the words, Lord, so that we will not have unclaimed answers. We want to know. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear every answer. Have all the guidance so that we are walking in the right direction and doing the right things that will bless you, that will honor you and bring you glory. So we declare today, God, that we will not fear no matter what is going on around us, that we will be still and know that you are God. Thank you, Lord, for this word today. Thank you for that joy. 
Thank you for restoring our hope today in you, Jesus. We love you so much, and we pray these things in your most holy name. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die. But I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.